Welcome to The Bo Show. In some of my recent episodes, I've touched on the unfolding Afghanistan situation, a tale of mass incompetence from the top down. We've been watching this unfold almost like a Hollywood movie, except it's real, all too real. I mentioned in a previous show that Twitter and the wonderful Jack Dorsey have permitted the Taliban to speak on their platform. The same Taliban that permitted Al Qaeda to train in Afghanistan, which led to the September 11th attacks and killed thousands. Now, I try to stay away from personal attacks because those are not helpful. And let's face it, it's easy to criticize. But the Taliban are worthy of being on blast right now because they are, well, allowing blasts, if not orchestrating them. Even if it's ISIS, we knew what ISIS was and what they do. We know they have suicide bombers and plant improvised explosive devices. The Taliban said in a recent news conference, they do not believe that bin Laden orchestrated the 9-11 attacks. Are you kidding me? And we knew that this tragic situation was inevitable. And so we obviously withdrew people. So Hamid Karzai Airport in Kabul became the epicenter of a series of bombings that have killed a number of people, including 12 American troops. Have the Taliban condemned these suicide bombings? In a roundabout way, but they're pathological liars. We keep talking about the pandemic, the pandemic. Does anyone not realize that militant fundamentalist Islam is a pandemic as well? No place is safe because they operate covertly in cells. They have attacked embassies. They have attacked many foreign countries and even our own homeland. We had to create the Department of Homeland Security for this very reason. We have the enemy walking among us. I could give you dozens of names and incidents that can be traced back to militant Islam, even American born people. Do you remember John Walker Lind? He was the American who joined the Taliban and he has been released from federal prison having served a 20 year sentence. Terrorists like the Taliban take advantage of chaos. They capitalize on fear. This boils down not to politics, but ideology. We've been told that white supremacy is the biggest domestic threat we face. What about white stupidity? And I jest about this because Joe Biden and much of his non-diverse cabinet are white. But the truth is that it has nothing, of course, to do with race. It has to do with intelligence itself. The biggest threat we face right now is stupidity on so many levels. Dangerous stupidity. The Taliban is only as powerful as we allow them to be. You've heard the phrase, elections have consequences. Yes, they do. We are seeing that right now with Biden and his team. Biden's son, Bo, the same spelling as my own name, served in the US military, and he later died of brain cancer. It makes me wonder whether the Joe Biden of 20 years ago would have allowed this to happen. Is he that senile or is he that incompetent? I just don't know. Those who voted for him, I don't know what to tell you. I would say, I hope you're happy, but that would actually be sadistic because I hope no one is happy about this. But if you'll notice, every celebrity, every Biden supporter, every media figure is silent right now. No one seems to be running to Sleepy Joe's defense. But let's return to the Taliban and their greater orb. We know that there are many sects of Islam, Sunni, Shia, Wahhabi, these factions do not always get along, and probably the reason there will never be a true organized caliphate, because they can't all agree. ISIS-K is a faction of Muslims in Afghanistan that split off from the Taliban and pledged allegiance to the leaders of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. They view anyone that does not accept their version of Islam as an enemy, whether that's other Muslims like Shia Muslims, but of course the West as well. Laura Logan is reporting that Sirajuddin Haqqani, the deputy leader of the Taliban and also the Haqqani Network, a foreign terrorist organization, has broken off to join ISIS-K, which she believes is a flat out lie. The Taliban's head of intelligence has a big ally, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Laura Logan has been calling them out. Watch some of her stuff. And this is why these attacks are attacks on our way of life. It is them versus us. So we have to look at it as us versus them. There is no reconciliation. There is no negotiation. They do not accept how we live. There's no liberty. 
no democracy, no freedom of thought or speech or expression, no human rights, no women's rights. So while we squabble over here over little things like who makes more money in professional soccer or what pronoun to be called, you have multiple groups of people in the Middle East and in America who despise our way of life. They will stop at nothing because they feel they are doing the will of Allah. This is not Justin Trudeau and his peace socks. Can't we all just get along doesn't jive with these people. They are so willing to force their will on everyone that they are willing to die for it. The suicide bombers. They feel they can get dozens of virgins if they do this. There is incentive. So whether it's ISIS, ISIS-K, Al-Qaeda, the Mujahideen, the Taliban, they all pretty much have the same outlook. They definitely kill each other because each group feels they are right and have the proper interpretation of Islam. That's why they can't unify. But the underlying principle is to kill anyone that doesn't comply. They do this by force. There's no concern for human life. Therefore, they attack the West and America for our way of life. Even if we say that ISIS-K is more militant and violent than the Taliban, that's like saying that lethal injection is a little better than the electric chair. The end result is the same, coercion or death. The Taliban in taking over Afghanistan has permitted ISIS-K to conduct these suicide bombings. There's no telling how many there are there. The Taliban has said it doesn't think bin Laden had anything to do with 9-11. And Jack Dorsey thinks the spokesman for the Taliban, and I emphasize spokesmen, should be allowed to spew this garbage on his platform. That's despicable. To be using Twitter right now is in some ways supporting this madness. No one should be shocked by any of this. But we have elected people in this country who failed us. Our veterans are committing suicide at record rates because they wonder what their sacrifice was for. 22 veterans commit suicide every single day. Wounded veterans who have lost limbs trying to aid and, and just try to do their job. They are now watching the Taliban take over our ammunition and our equipment that they were using to train the Afghan army to defend itself. Great leaders don't wait for a crisis to happen. They plan for it. They have strategies in case things like this go bad. What plan did Joe Biden have? What plan did Anthony Blinken have? Right now, they can't even get what might be upwards of 1,500 Americans out of Afghanistan because of a bad plan. The people are getting ambushed as sitting ducks, and we have trusted the Taliban to allow this exit safely until August 31st. Biden believed that. Who in the Pentagon or State Department believed that? Did Blinken? Now we have dead Marines because of this blunder, just like we did in Benghazi, another major failure of leadership. We may never be able to stamp out radical militant Islam because it's a snake that keeps regrowing once you cut it in half. But there are smart decisions we can make to prevent it at all costs. Announcing to the world we are withdrawing was a celebration for militant terrorists, and more importantly, an opportunity. Our withdrawal is their advance. Our loss is their gain. It's an opportunity, even if on a small scale, to attack our people, our soldiers, and our way of life. This is why it is so critical for we Americans to wake up and take a stand. We have to defend America. But that's not just for our brave men and women in uniform who are sadly losing their lives. We defend America by our choices, our voting habits. We defend America by being America, by acting like Americans, not like woke, weak lemmings. Nikki Haley, the former ambassador to the United Nations, is calling for Joe Biden's impeachment or resignation after this disaster in Afghanistan. I think the number who call for this could grow. If President Trump can be impeached for a phone call, what do we do about a leadership failure that results in loss of American life? Captain Sam Brown, a U.S. Army veteran who was severely burned in Afghanistan from an IED, recently posted that what has happened in Afghanistan is a dereliction of duty by President Biden. He says that Biden ignored every warning from U.S. military and intelligence officials and waived a legal requirement for the Department of Defense to report a detailed risk assessment to Congress. 
He instead chose to withdraw hastily and without a plan. Captain Brown finds the president's refusal to take responsibility inexcusable. Biden put his trust in the Taliban, especially with respect to securing the outer perimeter of the airport and also to assure safety. Captain Brown is right. He knows this better than anyone. He has the scars to prove it. The Taliban are not and were never to be trusted. Now we have 1,500 other Americans still stranded there. That's unacceptable. That destabilizes the region and will likely lead to more attacks and terror. This is why we have to, we have to defend America. When you give terrorists any slack in the rope, they will take it. Any sign of weakness, they will capitalize on. So we could see this coming for a while. None of this should surprise us. But rewind to 2020, a pandemic, a presidential election, election of members of Congress. The same party takes over all three. And this is the leadership we are left with. I can understand the desire to get all troops out of the Middle East so that they can fight their own squabbles, you know? But we have too much at stake, especially with respect to Israel, that one tiny little strip of land that everyone seems to hate, but they represent peace and stability. And even though our government does business with many Arab countries, such as Qatar, the Emirates, the Saudis and others, all of them have been at least somewhat responsible for a portion of terrorism, whether they allowed it to foment in their own territory or whether they turned a blind eye. At the heart of the matter, of course, is the ideology, the fanaticism. Most world religions can coexist because they don't call for destruction of infidels or those who don't believe. America was founded upon religious freedom so people could worship as they choose. But in that region of the world, religion is not an option. Many of the governments are formed around the religion and it is the bedrock of the laws, such as Sharia law. Iran is a great example of this and because of the money many of these countries have, they can use their money to aid and abet or train terrorists to do their will. Sometimes that may be against a different sect of Islam or whatever infidel they want to kill on that particular day. They are all jockeying for their version of the religion. And in many of their laws and texts, it seeks a caliphate. This utopian unidirectional Islamic rule that extends like the Roman Empire. That can never happen if America is to succeed because a caliphate would seek America's destruction. So when you see cells or factions, they are just as committed to seeking the destruction of America. When they do these suicide bombings, it gives them fuel for their cause. It's like, it's like they've won at least just a, a one battle because it's easy to strap a bomb to yourself and go in a crowded place among innocent people. Enemies thrive on weakness. Even look at Russia and China moving in on this. They are mobilizing and they're licking their chops. The United States has never been weak. Even when we have made mistakes, we did it usually from a position of strength. We look weaker now than we ever have been before with this latest avoidable blunder. The world and our allies expect us to be strong. We rely on mutual strength. But now you have parliaments all across the world scratching their heads and lamenting the weakness and cowardice that Biden and his cabinet have displayed. Because other countries who joined us in the fight against terrorism, especially in Afghanistan, they lost blood and money as well especially in Iraq and Afghanistan. They have to be totally disheartened to see their efforts in vain as well. It's like having your quarterback quit on you in the middle of the fourth quarter of the game. Rep Dan Crenshaw, a former Navy SEAL, said it very well. He said that we have to accept this reality, this inconvenient truth, that every day when we wake up, someone out there is aiming to kill us and destroy our way of life as much as we want it to be different, and as much as we have tried to export liberty to other parts of the world. Nation building has been largely ineffective as we have watched Iraq and now Afghanistan become terrorist havens. And whether it's ISIS or ISIS-K or Special K serial, I don't know. It has a lot to do with the governing authority who allows these groups to foment, recruit, and train. The Taliban were never to be trusted, yet the inevitable happened. 
A hasty withdrawal without a plan resulted in immediate return to power by the Taliban. An unsecure airport, Americans and Afghans left behind, and now 13 U.S. military dead and many others wounded unnecessarily. I think the word, word unconscionable comes to mind. I've been listening to many military personnel and veterans and specialists discuss this over the past few days, and none of them can seem to wrap their minds around the decision making. That's why the title of this episode is, We Knew This Would Happen. Even civilians like you and me, who have no military experience, knew this would happen. And Joe Biden gives a 20-minute presser with words coming out so slowly you think you might have another birthday before he's finished. And even admits he has a list of press per personnel he was instructed to call on. Instructed? I don't recall a president being told what to do. And then he had the nerve to say he had a meeting to run to. I watched Press Secretary Jen Psaki dodge the exact question I'm asking in this episode. Did the president see this coming? She said that they had been monitoring the situation. Come on, man. Monitoring? No. U.S. military and intelligence was warning him over and over again. He ignored it. And that led to an unnecessary loss of life. Why wasn't there military pushback? Why was he negotiating with known terrorists who can't be trusted and never could be trusted? Terrorists prey upon weakness. Whether we see ISIS-K, ISIS-L, all the way through ISIS-D, will we see that? Probably. They breed like rats. The great veteran I mentioned before whom I have met and interviewed, Captain Sam Brown, issued this statement. To the leaders at the Pentagon and those on the ground in Afghanistan, take charge of the situation. Do what's right for the Americans who are still stranded there and for our allies. It's time to reject politics and the State Department's lead. We'll be praying for the safety of those who are trying to help and for the return of all Americans and those allies who deserve our protection. And I agree with Captain Brown. We can take the politics out of this. Whatever happens with Joe Biden and what representatives decide to do about this dereliction of duty is up to them. And I hope that you voted for a representative that will vote based on your interests and desires. But allowing the Department of State to lead this effort, merely supported by the Department of Defense, is backwards. And in a greater sense, the reason this must be done, and done right, is that we must return to a position of strength. We must return to defending America on the home front and abroad. That doesn't mean going to war every chance we get. We know that's not a wise policy. It doesn't mean meddling everywhere we can. That has proven challenging as well. It means that we accept the reality that as Americans, we live lives of freedom. And freedom is not the envy of everyone. It can be the enemy of some. We have seen this in the militant Islamic world. We have to face the reality that militant Islam does not believe in freedom. It believes in justice by sword or by AK-47. It believes in a lack of humanity and human rights. Regardless of what you feel about Islam as a religion, you have to accept the reality that interpretations of it have caused the world immeasurable loss and strife, whether that comes in the form of Al-Qaeda or ISIS-K or the Taliban. Defending America means being on the offensive with these folks. I don't think this is a world for the both of us. They don't want it that way. They don't respect borders and treaties and summits and partnerships. They respect one thing, power, and who has it wins. Right now, Joe Biden and his team have surrendered power to the Taliban, and thus by proxy, ISIS-K, or whatever you want to call them. We are leaving, and they are advancing. Defending America means that you still have a say. We aren't trained like the military is, but we do get to demand accountability, and we do get to choose whom we think is best to lead our efforts to defend America. We only keep America as long as we can defend it. If we lose that ability, both militarily and in terms of the economy and intelligence, others are very ready to step in, such as Russia and China. Looking weak on the world stage is a very precarious position to be in. It just can't happen. The images have been heartbreaking, but this isn't like a tsunami or an earthquake where we had no control. We had the ability to mitigate this 
if not prevent it altogether. Bad decisions lead to death and destruction. If you think you're going to get anything less than that from the Taliban and ISIS, you're living in la-la land. And maybe it's time for those celebrities and influencers and all of the lemmings to finally recognize what's going on. You want to influence? Fine. Start defending America. Start demanding accountability. It's okay to admit you made a mistake. We all do it. We all share responsibility in making America great again. It's not just a catchy slogan. It's a charge. And it's the reality we face. Thanks for watching today. This is a heartfelt episode, and I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Because in Afghanistan, and in many parts of authoritarian worlds, you can't. Let's defend America. I'm Bo, and that's the show.